Welcome to the Dear Katie podcast. This is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. Before we get started, I just want to remind all of our listeners that the content of this podcast can be emotionally difficult for anyone and especially triggering for survivors of trauma. Please don't hesitate to reach out for support if you need to, whether to friends or family or anonymous hotlines. You can find resource information for survivors on the Take Back the Night Foundation website. We'll share that address at the conclusion of this podcast. Thank you so much, Claire. And as we start every session, we're going to hear from someone who wrote a letter to me, Dear Katie, a long time ago to share their own story for the first time. Dear Katie, up until a year ago, I completely ignored what happened. Instead of telling anyone, seeking help, or reaching out as you did, I told myself it never happened. I want to seek healing for that night and from hiding for the pain and living with the lies for far too long. I also want to help because I now have two precious little girls. I want them to grow into confident, assertive young women. Wow, and and thank you so much. So now let's turn to our current guest. Um, Angela, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your journey and your story with our listeners. Um, Would you kindly tell everyone a little bit about your background? Sure. I am 55 now, and um, I am a a grandmother, a mother of two boys um, and two grandsons, and I'm a registered nurse. And um, I live with my husband in Mandeville, Louisiana. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So what? tell us a little bit about the experience that brings us to your microphone today. I suffered a trauma back in 1984 that um, I suppressed for many years. And I had one of those pivotal moments back in the fall of 2018. And as my husband was watching the news, I was washing dishes and I overheard the talk of sexual misconduct. And it was a very high profile case. And as usual, I was feeling triggered and remembered my most deepest painful secret. And in that moment, I believed that I would remain silent as usual for the rest of my life until I heard those words, train rapes. I frozen at my kitchen sink and I was like unable to like, I couldn't even turn the water off. I stood there and there was a 17 year old me buried deep inside and for the last 35 years and she was screaming to be heard kind of like, a virus lying dormant for 35 years and it suddenly there was this catalyst and it erupted and and there I was and in my mind's eye I could see her there disheveled holding only one shoe her eyes panicked I wasn't able to see her lips or the bottom of her face it was though they had been sewn shut with old thread or it was tattered and like tightly drawn and I could see her there struggling to like unleash that thread unleash that silence the pain of her silence and a fury like twisted inside me and I just it was like taking over every move so with my wet soapy hands and a dish towel thrown over my shoulder I charged towards the TV, grabbing for the remote, pressing that button with the force of a lifetime of built up rage. And then I said it. That's what happened to me. So what was it that happened? And you said it was 1984? Yes. I, I was 17 at that time and I was still in high school and You know, I had the chance to go with a friend to Bourbon Street on a Sunday night, which was a school night. And, you know, back then I was a student at an all-girls Catholic school and 
I didn't have to worry about what I was going to wear the next morning. I knew I had my clothes out. And of course, I had to come up with something to tell my parents. And we, I came up with this story of going to a birthday party. And they didn't know that it was on Bourbon Street, of course. And I had a curfew. It was 10 o'clock that night. Here I am. I don't know if you've ever been at the French Quarter, but it is, you know, so in the, in the, through the lens of a 17 year old, you know, I'm just so taken in with the entire experience, you know, seeing all the sights and sounds. And um, it was the French Quarter, it was Bourbon Street. And, and so I just thought I would be able to make it home. My friend, she agreed that I would be home at at 10 o'clock and it wasn't a problem until I drank the alcohol and I noticed this really tall and handsome football collegiate staring at me. And at first I thought he must be staring at someone else. And I looked to the side and only to realize it was actually me. And then um, I made my way over and he he too, we sort of met up and, and I talked to, to him and his friends. And um, I, you know, I was in awe of that. I couldn't believe that here I am, little old me, and they are talking to me. Like, I felt really special. I had only really hoped he would ask for my phone number. So when he offered to bring me home, I... I just couldn't believe that I was going to be that girl that he would be interested in. And on, I blacked out as I left the bar. My last memory um, was someone trying to stop me from going. But I kept saying to my recollection, I'm okay. And I thought they would bring me home. But you must have been dazzled by the whole thing. I mean, being a young girl, naive. Um, oh, very. And and drinking. First time on Bourbon Street. Um, all these new and exciting um, things going on. Um, feeling very grown up, but at the same time not. And having their attention. It must have been pretty um, kind of overwhelming. It was. It was very overwhelming. I, I was, um, I and two came with that inexperience, mm-hmm. and um, that um, it spelled disaster for me in the end. It had anything? Did you had anything in your life? Anybody? Was there anything in your life that had prepared you appropriately for that moment? No, no. Um, you know, in school we learned that. Um, and I'll back up a second. I think I immediately thought, well, these guys are going to this really, you know, in Southern prestigious school. They cannot possibly be bad guys. Mm-hmm. I just had this in my naive mind that I was talking to good guys. Let's keep going. So he did not take you back to your house. After I turned that corner out of the bar I completely blacked out. And the next thing, I woke up lying on a bed inside of a dorm room. And I could sense that there was, now I know that it was that guy, that super handsome collegiate. He was standing kind of near my head. And I looked, and when I did, well, I was actually hurting because one of his friends was forcing himself inside of me. And as if that wasn't enough to comprehend, I actually saw another one of his friends standing next to the one hurting me. And he was fully naked and prepared. Um, I was disoriented. I was shocked. Um, 
I, I looked at faces. They had invited an audience there. Some were laughing. And as soon as they realized that I was fully awake, the handsome football collegiate who I thought liked me, I heard him say, that's enough. And they fled the room, except for the guy that I liked and his a few of his friends that were at the bar. I was, I, I cannot describe, I really, I didn't have the words then for what went through my mind and how I felt. And believe it or not, I still don't. It's been 37 years, and I really, I still don't. I never heard of anybody doing that. Um, I didn't know what to call it. I couldn't articulate anything as far as a crime goes. I thought the worst part for me was that I'm five hours after my curfew. There was a clock on the wall. And I remember, here I am, almost completely naked, in front of boys or men I did not know. So many of them. It haunts me to this day that they were able to view and touch my bare body without my knowing. I um, I stood up. I, I, I felt awful even having to dress in front of them. And I only found one shoe. So as the three or four of them are standing there, watching me crawl on the floor, desperate to find one of my shoes, which I never did find. I felt so powerless. Instead of shouting or yelling at them, I could, I could say nothing. I, I didn't know what to say, except I have to go home. And in that moment, I felt like I had been stranded on some mountain, icy mountain, and I had no way, no resources to get home. There were no cell phones. I remember that sick, oh my God, the rest of the world is home and safe and sound in their bed. And I have school in a matter of hours. And I'm inside of a college dorm. And I had to get home. So what did you do, Angela? They asked me where I live. I explained. And we got in. I had to follow them to their car. And I remember I had one shoe on and one shoe off. It was as though I expected to find my shoe somewhere along the way. I don't even know how I got into that dorm. The The fear of facing my mom and dad, knowing that I had only one shoe, that it was just five hours after my curfew. It was a dreadful ride home. Oh my gosh, Angela, I'm so proud of you for sharing all this with us. Do you think they gave you even more to drink? Because when you left, you weren't blacked out, passed out yet. Or do you think it was the alcohol was still having an impact on you? And that's... I just remember sipping on a daiquiri. And, you know, I don't know if you've had daiquiris, but they down here in New Orleans, they are, um, you know, full of... It was like drinking Kool-Aid with, with a little bit of alcohol in it or a lot of alcohol and. And so I don't know. I don't remember. I do know that I probably went to the bathroom while I was in the bar. Um, probably not even concerned about my drink. And so, yeah, anything could have happened with my with the alcohol. You would think that I would want to know, like, who they were. And I remember the days and weeks and even months following that possibly even years when I would hear that football team on the news 
instead of wanting to remember back then, I wanted to forget. I didn't want to remember their names. I didn't, I didn't want that. I didn't want to, I tried to forget all the details and how painful that was. It just seemed like if I forgot about it or didn't think about it, that it would go away. And so many, so many people in in your situation shared that same kind of response. It wasn't until 35 years later when I finally wanted to know that, again, that 17-year-old me coming full force to the forefront, wanting to be heard, that's when I later learned through a lot of determination and um, resourcefulness at my own hand, I wanted to find them. I wanted to say to them, this is what you did to me. And so I later learned after finally disclosing to my parents, I just disclosed to them two years ago. And it was through my parents that I learned a lot about what happened that night. And, um, which it sounds awful to tell, to disrupt their lives and tell them something, but it was also very validating. It was validating for all of us. My mom and dad never knew what really happened to me that night. Once I, I spoke my truth to my husband that night, I went to bed that night, not thinking I would ever tell anybody. And within a matter of days, uh, I was on the phone with Rain, um, and 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 then the next day, I call and that night I called the police. I wanted all of a sudden my crime or my what happened to me. I felt like it deserved something, the respect that it finally deserved after all these years. I wanted to be in this included in those statistics. I felt like I was giving grace to something really bad that happened to me. And that felt very empowering, very validating. And I wanted proof. And I I don't know if that was just a lot of luck, a wing and a prayer. It was, but I found them. Um, my husband agreed once I, once I notified the police department and the detective said these words to me, well, do you have a name of my perpetrators? And I was floored and determined and very angry. And I signed on to every resource I could possibly think of. It was like through the internet, um, e-yearbook, Tulane. I was constantly daily looking for any sign, any, anything. I would Google Tulane football, 1984, looking at pictures, trying to find people, trying to find those faces. Cause I did have, well, I didn't remember so much of the other details, I had some semblance of their facial features. And that is what led to me finding them 35 years later was that little semblance of one set of eyes. And I, you know, it was, I think like a Saturday, it was six months after I had been looking my, like I said, my husband and I hired private investigators and um, they took me to to, um, to the university and um, they wanted to know if what dorm it possibly could have happened. And I remember walking several dorms. It was like um, open house and um, it was during the, the, Thanksgiving holiday or close to it. And here I was and I fit in. I look like a parent walking 
into the dorms um, and um, finally when we got to a certain dorm um, my invest- private investigator said you just had a very visceral it was obvious response to this dorm and, and I did I had a sense that I had been there before so my um private investigators um could not they tried really hard they said they looked up you know lots of newspaper articles and got in touch with you know former students of of Tulane and 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 to no avail and but here I was on a Saturday morning, you know, my husband was out of town and it was probably sometime in March. And, and so it was, it wasn't a, a, a nice pretty day. It was kind of like one of those dreary days where you're home and happy to be in your, you know, pajamas and slippers. And, um, and I Googled it for the millionth time. Tulane football, 1984. And it was this book popped up and it had a silhouette of a quarterback on there. And I just clicked on it and it said football program. So I went to eBay and plugged in the same Tulane football, 1984. And there they were, these football programs that you can order. I ordered 83, 84, 85. And on the night of April 4th, they were delivered to me. And I went from not knowing for 35 years who my perpetrators were, their names, where they were from. I could not remember any of that. My mom and dad not knowing. To all of a sudden, I'm looking at the face of my tall, handsome guy, the one who betrayed me and allowed his friends to violate and defile me. There he was. So with Facebook and I was able to locate him and see the aging person It was one of those watershed moments where I didn't want to be in my own world at that time. I didn't want to be a working person. I didn't, I wanted to like throw myself into my entire case and forget about nursing, forget about everything else. I I was so absorbed into each and every step. And, and I finally had that moment where I found him and connected. What a story. So Angela, what, what proceeded from there? You gave the names, did you give the names to the police? After that, um, you know, I, I sent a picture of my 17 year old self to a text message to a text phone i googled you know a search finder and how you find you know people with their addresses and phone numbers and i found some for him and to one of those phone numbers i just sent my my picture of my 17 year old self and he remembered me right away he responded and said and he apologized He gave me details. I learned what happened to my shoe that night when I said to him via text message, who put the bruises on my thighs? And he texted their names back. Um, When he said, oh, they threw your shoe out of a window. I, you know, that was my shoe. It gave me balance. And 
I've spent much of my adult life with a sense of imbalance. So learning those details came with a price. And in my adult life, so I've had so many phases of my story, the phase immediately after at 17, and then the 52, it's like this dichotomy between, you know, situations and it, it's starkly different, you know. So here I am, I'm, I was 52 and I suddenly went back to the scene of my crime and reliving me at 17 year old. At 17 years old, I, I didn't feel 52. Mm-hmm. So where, where is your story now? What, what is happening now? Well, you know, with the, with the university itself, I felt really, I did a lot of Title IX research and I was hoping that they would at least, you know, address my perpetrator, especially since they had proof. I sent the university all the text messaging. I think I surprised everybody, including the university, because I found them when everyone said, your chances of finding them are very slim after 35 years. But to the contrary, I I found them and... The university has not addressed my perpetrator's all-time letterman status. I So he is able to maintain that. I was hoping that there would have been some recourse for him. But that's painful, and I've had to process that. And um, right now I'm in therapy, and it's the best thing I could have ever done was go to therapy, group therapy. And um, I've gained a lot of insight and help in that direction. Angela, I'm wondering um, how what you're learning in therapy and also learning about trauma and processing that has impacted your work as as a nurse. You know, Claire, it really has. I was moving forward I really thought when I gave a keynote address um, a couple of years ago, I thought that that would be the height of my, you know, um, recovery. Like I would, you know, be better and, but it wasn't. It felt anticlimactic in a way, like as though I had more work to do. And I wanted to talk about what happened to me. I had been silent for so long and I, I, I just, it, But not everyone wants to talk about what happened to me. And so that's why I was drawn to therapy and group therapy. I'm currently um, contemplating becoming one day uh, a sexual assault nurse examiner. You know, LSU has a program and I passed and or, you know, completed the didactic portion of the adult um, segment. And and so. I'm still tossing that around, you know, if that's in my future. Well, I think you would be an amazing forensic nurse, no question about it. It would thank be you. really stressful, of course, but thank um, you. That yeah. self care piece would be really critical. Right now, I'm just focusing on on my mental health and and um, you know, getting, you know, learning what makes me at peace and whether it be painting, which I, I, I'm not a painter, but I, I have bought watercolors and I've learned to go outside and enjoy things that I didn't recognize before, you know, like birds in my yard. I'm, I'm finding peace in some of that. And, um, and just doing a lot of self-reflection and, and positive affirmations without those positive affirmations daily, I, I would still be stuck. Angela, as we get towards the last part of our conversation with you, one thing that I think would be really interesting to talk about is your husband's response when you disclose this to him. Yeah. I didn't know how to navigate just going from disclosure to, to living. It was difficult. And my husband 
was amazing and still is. I got a text just before I started this with him saying, good luck. I'm supporting you in every way. It was amazing. I just, you know, I think, Angela, what I like to really, you know, each one of our survivors we have on this journey, this these episodes with us is so unique and um, so brilliant and beautiful. And I think one thing that is going to help our survivors is thinking about When do I tell my partner? When do I tell and how? And, you know, I think what's interesting to me is to think about the fact that you had been with this, your husband, your partner for a long, long time, and you'd shared all these different pieces of you with him. And then you unleash this secret and it is ginormous, right? And I think sometimes when we think we know someone backwards, forwards, up and down, like your husband, right? Right. And then all of a sudden we tell there can be a feeling of betrayal, right? Our partner could be like, why didn't you tell me? Why did you not trust me with this? There can be, there can be all kinds of responses from the people we tell. And what I like thinking about with you is that you did, you're glad you did, you found support. Um, But I don't, I don't know, it doesn't sound like you prepped him in any way for what you were going to tell him, or gave him a bunch of books to read, or um, you relied upon the, the bond that you had, and there was no special training that he needed to be great for you. And what I like thinking about is truly, I, I, I hope our listeners and their supporters will hear that part. There's no special degree you need in being helpful to someone else who's been through trauma. There is only the support, the belief that I let me know what I can do to help you. Right. You don't need a degree in in psychology to to be helpful to a survivor exactly and that's beautiful and so important that we share with our our listeners i think um and 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 if we stick on that theme just a moment more is there anything else in that same genre of you know what he does especially that's supportive or helpful i mean even just down to the text right before we started talking right um it's just that empathy and that like i'm here for you don't ever forget it um is there any other small you know because everyone's learning from you and what you share so is there anything else that you think he does that is especially beautiful and wonderful that you could put out there for everyone else i I know that when I was going to therapy, um, he would say, you know, you seem happy when you get home. I would think that you would feel sad or, and I said, no, because when I'm, I'm at therapy or in group therapy, I feel so connected and I could see the look on his face. And so we decided that he would, um, once a week, he will ask me, is there anything, because he gets busy and I'm busy and, you know, and, and that's when we talk about it, you know, we, so he gives me that opportunity to be heard and that's helpful, you know? So one day a week, we just kind of, I find that it's great for my marriage just to be able to have that, those moments where I can say, well, this is kind of how I felt this week. These are what my triggers were. So he understands now what triggers are and You know, we would, if we're at a restaurant and someone has that same type, you know, logo or wherever we could be, he will look at me and say, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And that, that is helpful. And he didn't know any of this. He didn't know, but he knows that he could see the look on my face and I'm not where I need to be in that moment. Right. And I love that you're, you scheduled it. <laughs> I think so, there, there are so many of us that, you know, we, nobody has time for anything, even listening to a podcast sometimes. But, but the fact that he and you were willing to put this on your to-do list and commit to the conversation shows that there's that love and prioritizing what is really important in life and, 
you know, you have so many gifts, Angela, and so much talent. And I think you become even more powerful and, and able to give those gifts to others with his support and the way you all have gone about um, learning and talking through it. And it, and I like the, the rhythm and cadence, the pace at which you go. It's not like a, a you know, a four hour marathon of like, let's, let's really immerse ourselves in rape culture right now. Um, it's nice. It's, it, it's so, um, it's so, it's so perfect. You know, it's, it's not overwhelming. It's manageable. It's doable. And it informs, you know, how you two interact with one another. So kudos to the both of you. Claire, do you have anything else you want to ask um, Angela before we wrap? Any, you've already shared tons, but I'm thinking any specific things, any bits of wisdom that you would like the listeners to take away from what you've learned in this process. I know that when I found out I was past the statute of limitations, not that justice in that manner is for everyone. Um, but I wanted justice. I wanted some kind of justice. And I, I didn't like when people said to me, it's okay that you waited. It may be okay for others, but at that time it wasn't okay for me that I waited. I had to grieve that absence, that time that I've lost. I had to grieve years of, of silence. And so, yeah, it sounds okay that you, anybody can wait, but I just wish that I would have been informed back then. Yes. But Angela, your story, think about this. Those men are parents. They are maybe grandparents. Yes. Those men have got to own what they did because of what you did. And it is never too late. It is never too late to call people out on what they're, they've done in their past. And, you know, there's, there's no excuse. There's only saying I am more than sorry. I, and, and asking them to rethink it and, and asking, you've thought about it. Think about this. You have thought about this for over 30 years. Yes. There is no reason that those men who did this to you should get away with not thinking about it. Right. <laughs> You're right. You've had to think about it. And they have got to know and own and take responsibility. And there's no um, number of years or a way they can ever redo it. That's right. But they, they can think about what they could do. Right. <laughs> so I am super proud. Thanks. Super proud of you. Thank you, Katie and Claire. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. And for all of our listeners to the Dear Katie podcast, I hope that you will continue to grow, be strong, be fierce, be fearsome. Um, <laughs> don't give up. You track these people down. You do what you need to. You you thrive and you, you survive. Angela is such a beautiful um, testament to that. And um, Angela, the one thing I wanted to pass along, I think we had a conversation about your love of tea. Um, yes. as a self soothe. So, you know, today I, I'm going to drink a cup of tea and what was the flavor you I love like, so much? It's, it's by revolution and it's Earl Grey mm -hmm. lavender. Oh Earl my Grey gosh. Lavender. Well, today okay. is my Earl Grey, my Earl Grey <laughs> lavender day. Yes. Um, thank you. So thank you again. Thank you. Claire, anything else you want to add for our listeners? The only thing I want to add is that if you are interested in looking for some resources that you don't know where to find them, just visit um, our website, takebackthenight.org, and you can find a list of resources there, and they may lead you to others. And um, there's also information about a legal support hotline. Just remember that we're never alone, and Angela's testament to that. There are many walking with us in healing and in supporting survivors and in ending sexual violence. Yes. So this, this is Katie Kessner. And this is Claire Kaplan. And all of us stay safe, be strong, and together we're going to shatter the silence and end the violence. Take care. <laughs>